you, Kieran. And can I just reiterate, please feel free to meander up to the bar throughout and grab a drink. This is what it's all about, having a lovely night out on the town. Um, it's fantastic to be here in what is the final of the great big science reads for National Science Week, um, which has been fabulous. Well, it really turns out to be a, a fortnight across Australia, I think. And just to let you know also, we are recording to, tonight for the ABC as well, for Radio National. Look, we're here to save ourselves from ourselves tonight. Um, humanity is on a slippery slope of excess and extreme, our guest Deirdre thinks. Um, why? Because we've taken our evolutionary heritage a step too far. We eat too much sugar, we uh, eat too much salt, too much fat, we're taking beauty to an excess by pumping ourselves full of collagen and, and silicon and Botox and the whole bit. We like things too cute, too tasty, too sexy, and it's having consequences. So we're going to put a, put a lid on all your fun. Uh, for good reason, let me <laughs> introduce uh, our special guest for tonight. Dr Deidre Barrett is a psychologist um, on the faculty of Harvard Medical School's Behavioural Medicine Program. Uh, and she does an extraordinary range of things, which we'll hear a little bit about. But she's written a whole host of books of which the latest is Supernormal Stimuli. Um, she's also written a book called Wasteland and the Committee of Sleep. She is past president of both the International Association for the Study of Dreams and also um, the American Psychological Association's Div30. Now they're a network who focus on hypnosis in psychotherapy. Um, and she's editor in chief of the journal Dreaming the Journal of the Association for the Study of Dreams. Doesn't that sound like a fantastic job? Let's give her a warm welcome. <laughs> the Association for the Study of Dreams. This is actually a big part of your work. It's not so much going to be the focus of our discussion tonight, but why dreams? What drew you to dreams? I, I think my own dreams were very vivid from childhood on. I've only heard one dream researcher say that they don't remember many dreams and they're sort of dull. I think that one's own dream tends to draw one into the field. Did you have wild dreams? I have the most bizarre dream life. Yeah, I mean, I had what I didn't realize then was just much higher dream recall than, than most like multiple dreams a night all the time. So this whole other life going on. Did you take to writing them down? Um, Junior high is the first time I did that, but I was really fascinated with them at four or five before I could have been writing them down. So what, what have you, I mean, I'm curious, what have you actually investigated about dreams? Because you also do research as well as work in private practice, as well as teach at Harvard. Um, yeah, I've, I've done a little bit of research on all kinds of things about dreams. I started off more therapy oriented and using techniques to intervene with people having post-traumatic nightmares to shift the nightmares. Um, currently, my research is more about dreams and objective problem solving. I, I did one study just investigating the spontaneous occurrence where lots of artists and writers, you know, dream things that they use in their work, but so do scientists and mathematicians and business people and just about every field, there are some distinctive patterns. I think dreams make breakthroughs to problems where either visualizing something is especially important or where thinking outside the box is important, where you're stuck on something exactly because the usual approach is wrong. I think those are the two things that dreams do better. So, And you've been actu actually able to document that in some way. Yes. I mean, I fr first I was just documenting the spontaneous occurrence, but then coming out of the work I did clinically, where a lot of the nightmare stuff is trying to influence dreams with pre-sleep suggestions, I started doing that with the problem-solving dreams, like telling yourself at bedtime in a systematic way that you want to dream an answer to this particular problem wow. greatly increases the rate of those. They, they, they happen anyway to people who are just ignoring their dreams sometimes, but for people who are doing certain systematic things to solicit it and pay attention to it, it's a much more frequent How fantastic. Occurrence. So that's, that's what my most current research is about. Which is interesting because you also um, have done research and use clinically hypnosis, don't mm -hmm. you? So that's a sort of interesting um, and related process where you actually direct someone um, in a session under hypnosis. You might give them a suggestion that might then change their behavior. 
after that session is over. Yeah, I was trained as a clinical psychologist, so I started off looking at all these things in relation to therapy with people who have some very identifiable problem, but I've become more and more interested in just the normal psychology and the applications of these things more to creativity and sort of achieving beyond the norm rather than just correcting problems. Well, Deidre, we're, we're here to um, talk about a theme in some ideas that you have in evolutionary psychology. Mm -hmm. And it might be worth us just reminding people um, how evolutionary psychologists think about the world and, and us in it, because they've got quite a distinct way of thinking about humans and what we do and why we do it. What, what is evolutionary psychology? Well, it's just applying Darwinian principles to human behavior. I mean, Darwin actually was quite interested in emotions and behavior and saw them as evolving out of natural selection, just like shapes, feathers, you know, the, the kinds of things that people associate more with him. But psychology didn't really pick it up until very recently. William James paid some attention to Darwin's theories. Who but, was a sort of the father of psychology. Yes. But, but then it was kind of ignored until really the last couple decades. There's been a lot of emphasis on how many psychological theories just don't make sense from a Darwinian sense. They're attributing all kinds of things to motivations and impulses that if most of the population had them, we would not be successfully reproducing. And that basically any human behavior has, that, that most humans have, has to have had some adaptive purpose. It doesn't have to be adaptive now, but it has to have been adaptive through most of evolutionary history. So, um, so the idea that, that we evolved for hunting gathering on the savanna about 10,000 years ago and had a very, very good set of impulses that read us in the right direction then, and only because of all of modern technology and population density and all the changes relatively recently, evolution doesn't really keep up. So we, um, evolutionary psychologists like to say that we, we house a, you know, a caveman mind and a modern um, head. So a stone age mind yes, in a 21st yes, century skull yes, or something. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's how it really is though? I mean, are we really stuck back on the savannah? when we think about our mind and our behaviours and our dispositions, our um, instincts? I, yes, I think our instincts are there. I mean, one thing that, that is different about humans that we did evolve long ago is much more flexibility in our behaviour because we're such a long-lived species with such a large brain, much less is rooted in really simple instincts. And so we have much more cortex than most animals and this whole prefrontal area that does all this abstract thinking. So we can override instincts more easily than most animals. But yes, I do think our basic instincts are there for that hunting gathering um, lifestyle. And the, the phrase that at least in the US is popular about just trust your instincts or listen to your body that would really lead you toward the right thing if you were in a small tribe on the savanna, and it may lead you toward food that's really bad for you and spending all your time in front of the television instead of with real people and all kinds of things in today's modern technological society. So that's what we want to unpick today, why mm -hmm. you think there's this really powerful disconnect between um, our Stone Age minds and our contemporary environment that in a way, uh, so you, you draw on this idea of supernormal stimuli, which is very interesting. Tell us about the chap who originally coined that phrase and the extraordinary work that he did. He was a Nobel laureate for it. Um, yeah, Nico Tinbergen uh, came up with the phrase and he was studying animals, mainly birds and fish actually, insects sometimes, their behavior. And, um, and he, he was interested in what their instincts were actually coded for, and he approached this by creating dummy objects to vary um, one thing at a, at a time. And th this picture up here is oh he, made, he made fake um, bird, bird's eggs, varied the size and the color and the markings, 
And basically he found that bigger was better, that whatever the natural color of the egg was, a more intense color was better. If it had any little gray dapples, big black polka dots were better. So he could get a bird that laid a pale blue gray dappled egg to sit on this giant bright blue black polka dotted egg that it would slide off and ignore its, its real eggs because it wasn't coded for the gestalt of a healthy egg. It was coded for blue polka dots big. Come that and was, get me. Yeah. I mean, it was almost comical, some of the things that he observed, wasn't it? I mean, yes. the fact that a, a, a bird would sit on a massive egg. I mean, even, tell us about the volleyball and the goose. Yeah, it, it, the, um, it's sitting for most types of birds, but for ground nesting birds, if their eggs get dislodged from the nest, they, they have a natural instinct to roll them back with, with their beak into the nest. And just like with which eggs to sit on, the, the healthiest egg gets rolled back first if multiple ones are out. Mm. And for, for certain kinds of geese that lay medium brown eggs, they will choose a volleyball over the egg to roll back first. Where's Valiantly the survival instinct in that? <laughs> trying um, to give birth it's to It's because animals volleyball. don't very often encounter supernormal stimuli that look like their, the thing their instinct is coded for, but are, are more intense. If there had been sort of big fake eggs sitting out there, the instinct probably would have evolved somehow to rule them out. But animals only encounter the supernormal stimuli when some evil experimenter starts making them. But we're making them, we're <laughs> making them for ourselves. Um, we basically, from the start of technology, we've reversed the relationship between instinct and object. And instead of relying on our instincts to lead us toward the objects they're supposed to, we've begun to manufacture objects to optimally appeal to the instinct. And that ends up being the supernormal object, the equivalent of the giant polka dotted egg that's not at all necessarily good for us. So I've got this clicker. We're actually going to get you to do a bit of voting tonight as well. You're part of this, this evil experiment that we're going to conduct on you on and off throughout the discussion. So this is an example of what Tinbergen found, wasn't it? Let's have a look at the stickleback fish. So here is our question for you. Maybe you can explain this. Um, well, he, sticklebacks are territorial and the males will attack um, other males that swim into their territory. So he started making carved wooden dummy fish um, to see what aspects of the male stickleback were, were eliciting this behavior. Okay, so let's put this to the vote. Which dummy looks most like the real invading male stickleback? I'm going to push this, and after I've pushed this, you'll see a little countdown. So you've got a choice of one, two, three, or four, and you'll pick the corresponding number on your clicker. So here we go. Oh, I love interaction. And, I, we, and we get to see it's the results classy. and stuff I know, like so that. we're actually going to get fun. your vote on the screen in a tick. We should do this for political polling. I'm going to ask you about... <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be the topic of the moment, doesn't it? Okay, so here we go. Aha! So 40% thought number one. Oh, that's interesting. And number four, 45% thought number four. Um, so, um, I mean, obviously in one sense, number one is correct if you're looking from a human perspective, but from a male stickleback perspective, that dummy didn't get attacked at all. And the, the real stickleback in the previous picture has a subtle redness to its underside. And that is pretty much what they're responding to um, as an invader that you want to chase out. Um, and it's actually number three, apparently because oh. the red's a little more intense. Um, or intense. Present. Uh, and then, and then four, four gets more than, than two, probably because it's the right shape. He found if, if it didn't have an eye, it didn't get attacked. They just didn't perceive it as it, it could have the red underside. And if it didn't have an eye, they didn't perceive it as a fish, presumably. Uh, but the eye was almost the only anatomic detail that had, had to be there. And it could vary, it could vary in length, it could vary some in size, 
up. But, but the redder it was, and these are, these are all brighter red than the real stickle The bizarre back, yes. outcome is, tell me what happened when a uh, red postal van went yeah, by. Yeah, he also noticed that he had some of these in aquariums near the window. And, uh, and in Holland, the postal vans are red. So, so they, would, they would start trying to attack the edge of the aquarium when the postal van. It was re redness is male intruder to be chased out. So this, this um, super normal, so normal but super stimuli seems to explain quite a lot of behaviour in the wider animal world, doesn't it? Yes, he did experiments with mating instincts. He could get a butterfly to try, a male butterfly to try to mate with a cardboard butterfly if the stripes were more dramatic down the side. It didn't even need wings. It needed something shaped like the female butterfly torso with the stripes on it. And again, ignoring the real receptive female there, it would go for the better the striped cardboard torso. Cardboard, cardboard one. How depressing. And, and, <laughs> and, it, sorry, and, and the eggs led to all kinds of things. After eggs hatched, the, the parents would prefer to feed a fake beak on a stick if it was wider and or brighter red inside than the real chicks. It didn't matter if there was a chick attached. And the chick would try to beg food from a fake adult beak if it had exaggerated size and markings. So for just about every instinct, he could get the animal to try to nurture, try to be nurtured by, try to mate with, try to fight with some really silly looking object to, to our eye that, that had a more intense version of whatever, whatever was the releaser for that instinct. Which brings us to humans. <laughs> because you think that we're just as bad as the poor old stickleback and the butterfly and the, we, we are also seduced by supernormal stimuli and that's a big worry for you. Yes, I mean the reason I wrote this book is evolutionary psychology has picked up a lot of Darwin's ideas and some ethology ideas which is, is the kind of Darwinian branch of animal behaviour that Tinbergen was a part of, but somehow evolutionary psychology never adopted the idea of supernormal stimuli, and I really think that of all of the evolutionary concepts, it's the, the most important and the most directly relevant to human behavior. So I wanted to introduce that idea to evolutionary psychologists and, and to the general public. So the book has a fair bit of more, more general, more accepted evolutionary psychology ideas that kind of come from everyone, but with a big emphasis on how the supernormal stimulus concept really relates to all of the problems in our modern world. And for you, it starts with this food. Yeah. I actually wrote a, a previous book, which... So we've got a picture of... Oh, we'll, we'll explain that in a tick. This isn't one of the clicker questions, is it? No, it's not. It's no. not. Um, don't uh, worry, we're not going to make you eat any of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I actually, three years before Supernormal Stimulus, I wrote another um, book, which actually my working titles don't feed the animals, but it got titled Wasteland, spelled W-A-I-S-T-L-A-N-D by the publisher. And it was basically just applying the concept of supernormal stimuli to what's wrong with our health to eating, to exercise, to, to some of, of the things that have gone wrong about our physical health. And so, so it was this, some of these food and exercise issues that I got started on. And although I think everyone is aware of what's wrong with our modern refined food, what's not healthy about it, we may not take it seriously enough, but we're aware of it, when, when you look at, the, at it from an evolutionary standpoint, it started way before that. It really started with agriculture. Humans on the savanna were eating this vast array of food, the majority of their diet being leafy green vegetables and little bits of meat, little bits of seeds, little bits of fruit when it was in season, but just lots and lots of vegetables. And as soon as people began agriculture, grains became the mm. vast staple of the diet, whereas as seeds and their equivalent had been a small part. So rice and wheat yeah. and And they barley. started growing the grains to have more and more calories and somewhat by accident less and less of any of the other nutrients. 
so the the tear scent, which is the ancestor. So here we've got just for the radio audience, we've got two uh, ver just to describe the picture yes, we're seeing. Yes, sure. Um, the 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 ancestral tear scent, which is the plant that corn came from, um, has has these narrow seed pods that are lots of fiber, lots of vitamins and antioxidants and relatively little simple starch and then you have but corn. it looks revolting it it looks <laughs> yeah dry and chewy and not many people if this were a clicker question would be choosing that they want to eat the the tea sink but it's much better for you um, the the corn has lost most of the fiber um, most of the antioxidants and vitamins and has gained just all the starchy it's got more calories than than that and it tastes so sweet tiny. yes more more sugar more starch uh, but less nutrients and and that's sort of what agriculture sort of refined foods into lots of sugar and starch even before modern technology started refining it further and further into the packaged things that we But back on, if we're thinking about our behaviour and our eating behaviour, back on the savannah we were drawn to the same things, weren't we? We were drawn to fat, sugar, all yes. the things that gave us yeah, energy. Yeah, fat, fat, was, fat was scarce. It was nuts or certain meats, although animals were much leaner then. So getting a little fat was important and that's why it was hard to find. We're really coded for that. Sugar was basically mainly in berries which were and other fruits which were only around in smaller supplies at certain times of year. Salt was relatively hard to come by. We weren't mining it out of the earth and yet we need to have some in our body. So these are the things that were really coded to look for because they were hard to find. And it's not that humans didn't eat lots of green leafy vegetables and have a mild draw toward that. But they were not hard to find, so they were not the prioritized good taste. But we, if we've got these big brains, why are we so hell bent on um, eating what kills us? Well, are we are we really <laughs> that stupid, or our or our is it our instincts that are stupid in the modern context? Well, our instincts are what are leading us toward eat the cheeseburgers, drink the milkshakes, you know, just follow the simple instincts. Um, but I think it's another issue is that we're, we're much more coded for threats that will kill us right now. Um, you know, if, if a lion walked in the room, that's something that your savanna instincts, you know, know what to do about. And the idea that there's a correlation with getting cancer and type 2 diabetes 20 years from now is not really mm. as coded in but as... It, in terms of our health, it is the equivalent of a lion walking yes, into the room, Yes, yes. There, there's a group of researchers in the United States that, that have, have started trying to promote the term sedentary death syndrome because they think that is so much scarier than it, it just means you're going to get all these illnesses and potentially die sooner if you don't exercise and you eat too much. But sedentary death syndrome that everybody's at risk of that is kind fantastic. of get, gets your attention. So I think I think it's that the we don't perceive the, the the risk and we don't we don't think about it realistically. There are other issues like um, well, they've set up a network too, haven't they? The uh, what the network of scientists against uh, inactive related disorders or yeah, something Yeah, they have like all that. kinds of acronyms, but my favorite phrase is the sed sedentary death syndrome. S they SDS. really want to Yeah, they really want to popularize that as this thing that that people are Are people at risk paying of. attention? Um, I, I think, yeah, I, I think, think obesity is on the, the rise if, if we look at the latest data I, in know, Australia. I, I'm optimistic long term. I really think that society is finally going to, in, in the States, we've really turned around on tobacco and smoking. And it took, a, it took a long time after the statistics were there on how much lung cancer and other other causes of death were related to, to smoking. And it, and it kind of started with not advertising cigarettes to kids, mm -hmm. and it's really expanded to. And, and I think that you just see the preliminary 
hints of that with people getting more aggressive about not advertising junk food to children, just a but little bit. But it's hard bit. to regulate behaviour in the States, isn't it? Because people are so hell-bent on def you know, defining their own agenda. I'll eat myself to death if I want to because that's my autonomy. You but know? you know, when I was a child, I grew up hearing, you can't tell adults not to smoke in public. And, and now we do. So, so I think that one can make that shift. And people do it when they really appreciate the danger. Like, I mean, take most really dramatic illegal drugs. I mean, people know that snorting cocaine or shooting up heroin would feel really good right now, but we're not all doing it or seriously considering doing it because we really recognize that that's not natural and that's not good for us and that might result in our deaths down the road. Mm. And, um, and you know, you don't hear people saying, oh, I know my kid shouldn't take heroin, but he likes it so much, how can I, you know, <laughs> deny him? So if we just really get it through our head that, that certain eating habits really will kill you and they'll really shorten your child's lifespan if you encourage them to eat a certain way, I think that we, we have the particle equipment to put the brakes on just simple instinct stuff once we really perceive the risk and take it seriously. And we're not there for food yet, but well, I... I'm sure not. It's amazing, isn't it? But we weren't there for tobacco mm. uh, 30, 40 years ago. So Interestingly, I'm Interestingly, um, as a psychotherapist who works with hypnosis, you mm -hmm. use hypnosis um, in some contexts with patients who want to reduce their weight. Um, who are obese, don't you? How, so what, how does that work? Yeah, what I mean, I definitely think that society is not going to turn around fast enough for the average individual who would like to do something now has to really swim against the tide. Mm -hmm. It'll be so much easier if we can change our environment back to something that's not pulling for the wrong thing. But yeah, with individuals, the, I think that the two approaches that, that help weight loss are kind of a cognitive behavioral willpower-based thing and then for people who are somewhat hypnotizable, that is often a really powerful fix because with hypnosis, you kind of get around the catch-22 that um, it's a long time before between shifting your eating habits and being the thin, healthy, athletic, whatever person that you want to be. You don't get the reinforcement quickly. You just kind of feel lightheaded and cranky the first day you're dieting. Mm. So hypnosis, you can vividly see yourself in the body you're going to have eight months from now if you eat like this. This is by you the suggestions feel, yeah, that you're you, giving them under hypnosis. Right, and, and their imagery abilities in the trance state, they really get to sort of experience the payoff. It, you know, my body will feel better like this, I will look better like this, what, sort of whatever that individual's main motivations are, they can really experience the success and then you give them some suggestions that tie it in to the, uh, to the particular behaviors. Uh, you can also, I mean, people have surgery with hypnosis as an anesthesia, so yes. overriding physical hunger messages is something that for for the more hypnotizable people hypnosis it seems can very do. possible well look from food to the next best thing um, sex and this is uh, let's let's try this one on people so we're going to give you 10 They'll seconds They'll probably get this one right to decide whether or not <laughs> <laughs> you are indeed male or female some people are rightly confused about this um, so now that you've made that very difficult decision um, and we should really probably have a third option there. I've just been doing a whole oh, lot of reading US, about... Oh, in the US, to be politically correct, you'd have ambiguous all kinds of genders options. and intersex people and really now I'm a firm believer in a third option for those people who don't know. So, think back to that first crush. I'm curious about this, about when people have their first crush. Um, what made you like them? Number one, attractive personality. Number two, hot and sexy, or three, good morals. Maybe give us a bit of context for this. Um, and why well, you think that sex is a big part of this super normal stimuli argument? 
especially porn, I gather. Um, they, there, there, were, there were sort of two interesting studies. I haven't hit go yet, by the way. <laughs> well, m maybe, maybe, maybe we, we should. should. Okay, yeah, here we, we go. Maybe we should get their answers before I tell them about other groups of subjects. Good day. So the audience are voting here at the Science Exchange here in Adelaide. And here's the vote. <laughs> you liars! <laughs> much, much closer to even than in most crowds. That's very so interesting. So let's spell it out. We've got personality. We've got 55% of men voted on personality versus 51% of women. Those would certainly <laughs> be statistically insignificant differences in each column, but the, the main thing that's interesting is that there's not well, a gender more difference than in the men. usual. Well, more women than men. 47% of women voted on the hot and sexy versus 45% yes. of men. You're just trying to get us all in the sack, aren't you? Um, and 2% of women voted Yes, that, that is the one way in which this is a completely typical group is good morals. zero percent of men, so we clearly um. have a totally <laughs> amoral audience of men here at the Royal Institution. But the, um, the, the two studies that this relates to, the, the, the first time there was any formal research, so, somebody did some fairly formal stuff back in the 1930s on American um, college students Oops. asking them that question, it was actually phrased a little bit differently. It was just physical attractiveness, not hot, sexy. Um, but, but way back in the 1930s, um, there was a pattern which tends to turn up today, but not in this group, um, no. for, for the, the, the males saying physical attractiveness um, overwhelmingly, the females saying personality overwhelmingly. And back in the 1930s, somebody seriously thought that good moral character was going to get a lot of, of votes, and it got almost nothing, even back in the 1930s. Um, but, but then I actually did a tally on a modern group, but they weren't asked this question this directly. They didn't have to say, I think about looks or I think about personality. But it was, it was actually an informal survey to start with before I turned it into statistics, which was the Washington Post had run a little column on first crushes. And then on their website, the columnist had invited people to tell about their first crush. And they got hundreds of respondents. And, um, and so I just coded for the, the adjectives mm. being used about, about the person they had the crush on. And it was really overwhelming in that indirect, we haven't asked you what you're attended to, you just freely describe the person you have a crush on. The, the women just described all of these personality traits, um, and when it was physical at all, it was like the way they smile, and, and you know these little sort of communicative things. And, and the men, it very much looks, even for the sort of ice queen distant, it, it wasn't always you know, somebody they assumed was going to get in bed with them, but it was, it was looks. Um, and, uh, so what's this got to do with supernormal stimuli? Um, <laughs> Maybe it's obvious. <laughs> uh, that, that crushes um, are, are sort of a supernormal stimuli. Very few people in either group, but especially the modern group, just described crushes on their peers. There were some of these, you know, person at, you know, at school or mm. something. Um, but most of them were on celebrities. For the, for the modern group, that was pretty much singers, actors, and sports um, sports stars. Which is a desire yeah. that will never be fulfilled. So in a sense, this is a stimuli that's yeah. gone astray. In the older group, it was sometimes just prominent people in the community who they didn't really know, but they at least physically saw in the 1930s. But it was, it, but it was still screen actors and, and things too. So, so it's, yeah, it's selecting sort of out of all the people on the planet and then putting them in film or television, scripting what they're saying to be, you know, to pull for either sex appeal or romantic um, notions. And, and so crushes, at least in our modern sense, are 
they're pulling on something that was there for beginning to establish real relationships with a member of the opposite sex, but they're really being pulled off toward these things that, that don't achieve that. Which is why you think it, find it rather extraordinary that some people want to have sex with a paper centerfold rather than a real human being. It, it's, it's really just like that paper butterfly, which looks so bizarre to, to us that, that doesn't have to have wings, it just has to have stripes down the side and, and will ignore the real live female. But that's not very different than what goes on sometimes with pornography. I mean, a flat, you know, nine-inch, you know, image of a woman um, as sometimes more attractive than a real woman is really just as bizarre as what the butterflies do. Well, speaking of attractiveness, let's get another vote. So we have two faces here. Face number one, both of a woman, a blonde woman um, with fair skin. Which face is more attractive, face one or face two? Here we go. I'm very curious about this. One face is slightly more angular. How would you describe the difference between the two faces? Um, or should we get the results first? Maybe we should get, get the results. results Here we go. Interesting. So face number one, which is a slightly more angular face of the woman, 60% of men thought she was more attractive, 50% of women thought she was more attractive. And on the other side, a more sort of Bette Davis look, isn't it? But yeah, to describe the differences, it's the face of a sl somewhat slimmer body, but, but only subtly. Uh, it's an even smaller lower jaw, um, even fuller lips. I mean, the, the, the other face has face some of those two. characters. Women are split evenly across the two, but mm -hmm. men found the slightly more mm -hmm. angular looking face more attractive, 60 to 40%. Mm -hmm. So the, the next slide tells yes. us a little bit about what these and really are. Um, the, um, the, the one face that somewhat more men picked uh, is, is a composite from, from just some of the most popular actresses and models today. And, and the other one is a composite from, um, I don't think there are any fashion models, there's I think one singer and otherwise all actresses, but essentially the same, the same kind of female ideal from uh, 1940. Um, and, and it's really a physically slightly different look. Um, and and because, the, because the clickers kind of only do yes, no, and categorizations, we didn't ask a lot of, of detail. But I'll bet if I'd sort of ask you for attributions to the face, it's not as simple as, oh, I just like that one or I just like that one, but, but what you would see as different, then you start getting sort of, uh, you know, well, maybe the f first one's sexier, but the second one looks sometimes to some people nicer, or more maternal, more like someone you'd want to marry, even if you'd rather have sex with the first one. Um, all Somebody those nuances. <laughs> yeah, so, so they're different and it seems like a, you know, a slightly, slightly older, slightly closer to a, a real person look. One of the other issues is that none of the old photos would have been photoshopped and I suspect because they do it so standardly in press release things that that some of those things being composited in the modern ones may not be the, fa the exact features of the real person, but they have those eyes enlarged slightly and jaw um, reduced slightly that they so often do in any printed Well, if photo. we were to make a dreadful assumption and, and draw a dreadful stereotype and say that, well, it's fairly obvious what men might um, find to be super normal stimuli about women, it's probably as clear as the nose on my face, times two. Um, what about women? What, what have you, um, what, what's your, what are your conclusions about women and supernormal stimuli well, in terms one, of the one thing attraction stakes? Yeah, one thing that's different, I mean obviously we could do the same with male faces and what females perceive, but there's also a difference just between what you prefer in the opposite gender versus your own. And it seems to be that, that in judging one's own gender that people like 
all of the things that seem to be signs of health, like facial symmetry and smoothness of skin and looking friendly, these things are valued for both genders. But then for the opposite gender, anything that's very specifically a, um, a sexual characteristic of that gender that correlates with estrogen and testosterone levels, that's where w women rate, you know, sort of men having broad shoulders and muscles and defined jaw, and men start liking that small jaw, big eye, things that are kind of fertility indicators rather than just health. We, so we, that's the we like people story. better if they look healthy and friendly. And we'll have our children and carry them to. Well, um, specifically for the opposite gender, we want them to look high in testosterone or estrogen. Do you buy that? Do you buy all that, those sorts of evolutionary stories about beauty and attraction? Um, Is it all just about getting a bonk and having a baby? I, well, again, I think a lot of it is With about... With the greatest respect. For I think a lot of it is babies. about detecting friendliness in others and health in others and some other things. But then, yeah, I think the, the choosing a mate, who you want to date, who you want to whatever, is very much about detecting fertility, detecting cues about, you know, who may be good in raising a child. Um, yeah. You also apply this idea to um, kind of cuteness and what's called neoteny. Just fill us in what, what, about what neoteny is and, and why we've gone a little bit astray there too. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if people are, are kind of depressed over all the studies on how much attractiveness influences our response to, to people in all kinds of, of settings, it, it's even more dismaying to see the research on infant attractiveness. There are all these studies with titles like the, infant, the Influence of Infant Attractiveness on Bonding that basically show that parents are nicer to cuter kids, teachers are nicer to cuter kids. Attractiveness, if anything, matters more when you're a child than it does for some of these later things. I, again, it's not, it's not the sexual specifics, but it's mm. the... It's the well, actually, we've got an example yeah, here of what makes something cute. So let's vote on this. Which We've got two teddy bears. Bear number one is a lovely old-fashioned looking sort of threadbare bear. And bear number two is a very cute little cuddly little um, gorgeous little fluffy thing. So which would you buy for a small child? Let's vote. Oh, they're so cute. In fact, we've got our models here which we stole from the play school set here on stage with us. Okay, here we go. Here are the results. There you go. So bear number one, the thread bear, bear only got 35% of the vote, whereas 65% of our audience would buy the cuddly little new looking yellow bear in a red shirt for their small child. And actually, I think if these pictures were more exactly like the ones in my book, it would be shifted even more because the, um, the original teddy bears looked a lot more like a bear and actually had a somewhat more of a snout and had the eyes closer together. The, the bodies evolved exactly like these two images, but actually the, the older bear has some cuter facial features of wider and larger eyes than the modern bear in this particular group. Really, modern bears tend to have gotten the eyes further apart and bigger. Uh, as well as the body shorter and chubbier with a proportionally bigger head. The face has changed in a direction that's probably not as represented there. Yes, Big that little eyes. bear doesn't really, it's got tiny little eyes. I know, it doesn't have as not cute quite a as, face but as some, but it has the cute body. There's something that draws but, us to cute things yes. though, isn't there? But in terms of which would you buy for a small child, your answer is what people do buy for a small child, but interestingly, when you, when you exaggerate the cuteness features, adults like a toy better, children from age four like a toy better, but, but think about it for a minute. Who should cuteness not matter to at all is babies and toddlers. They are not looking for something to nurture. They're looking for something to nurture them. So actually, if you give them the two versions of a bear, 
they prefer the more adult looking, less cute bear. Interesting. Um, up until about age three. But of course, we don't, they, they'll, they'll hold either, but it seems to be the sort of warm, cuddly, some resemblance to mother's body that they're going for in either bear rather than the cuteness. But of course, it's older siblings and adults that run out and buy the bear for the babies. So that's why they really, teddy bears have evolved um, into cuter and so cuter objects. <laughs> um, have we taken it too far? I mean, I'm thinking of that wonderful sort of kitsch culture in Japan where there is a sort of worshipping of the ultra, ultra cute with the whole Hello Kitty phenomenon and, you know. Yeah, there's this term kawaii there for, for cuteness and it's popular with adults too. I mean, here we, we like that stuff but we tend to give it to our children. But, you know, but businessmen have Hello Kitty charms hanging off their cell phones there in a way that you just wouldn't... Uh, the, uh, all of the anime toys are much more popular for adults and as um, one of the Japanese airlines has anime characters painted on the planes. Um, and, and I don't, that just hasn't caught on here. But Japan has the lowest birth rate and the fewest real infants, children, whatever, around mm, proportionally. So I think they may have something to do with why the nurturing instinct seems relatively stronger in their advertising. More Japanese things are advertised with cute, cute, cute little mm -hmm. things when they're not advertising, you know, children's market. And I mean, sex appeal certainly sells there, but cute sells even more than elsewhere. And I think maybe we're seeing our future as birth rates are gonna drop other places that that looking for things to nurture well, is going to be even higher and higher. Very hierarchy. interesting indeed. I mean, from nurture, you also thread uh, war into this theory. Mm -hmm. And you have a hypothesis here too. There's a lovely quote. Oh, it's a, not really a lovely quote. It's actually quite a devastating quote, but it's a very powerful quote that you pull from Plato, which says um, something like, um, where is it? The o only the dead have seen the end of war which is very confronting, isn't it? It says that war is always with us. Do you think war is essential, essentially a core part of human nature? Yes, at least, I mean, violence and aggression and especially defensive um, threatened violence, I think is, is very hardwired into us. And, and whether you call all levels of manifestation of that war or not, sort of is a definitional thing, but I think now that technology is here and populations are the way they are, that, that the translation of that into war is, is here forever, short of genetically engineering humans differently. I don't think we'd ever see the end of war, but I definitely think that just like with these eating and mating and everything else behaviors, that the stimuli out there have a lot to do with how, how much of it there is. And How I so? I mean, what you do point out, which is very striking, is that humans are the only species that kills our own species en masse. Um, and I'm thinking of those dreadful images that are coming out of Libya now um, of, you know, whole rooms of people being massacred mm -hmm. in the last week or so. Um, you know, that is striking about us, isn't it? That we commit violence against ourselves in a way that um, others, other animals don't. Yeah, I mean, you see, you see wolves fight and they, they fight and they really hurt each other for a while, but as soon as it's clear that one is winning the fight, the, the loser actually bares its throat to the, and, and the stronger one stops the aggression and they have established that, that the one that lost will be subordinate in, mm. in behavior to the one, the one that won, but, but he doesn't have to be killed to, to stop trying to, to better the, the alpha wolf. And I think that, that what's happened with human aggression and defense is that we, we magnify threat symbols that, that media kind of flag, I mean, the United States before invading Iraq was just hearing this, you know, they're building up weapons of mass destruction and they're going to be able, they're going to be lobbying um, we chemical biological yeah. warfare at you, you know, any, 
any second kind of fear, like, like just any sign of real threat gets broadcast a lot. Fake threats get broadcast a lot. And then surrender signals don't really get seen. I mean, when mm -hmm. we're dropping bombs on another country, we, we don't as immediately see the graphic images of the effects, much less are we showing the people who are trying to give up. We're showing the people who are still fighting us. So I think that part of that is just inherent in technology and media, and then part of it is very intentionally manipulated by leaders, politicians, the military to, you know, to sway opinion. And there's an evolutionary story here too in that it, it, it was um, appropriate for us to look after our own, our own kin so that we could kind of convey our genes into mm -hmm. the next generation without the sort of threat of them being diluted by others. So that, that's where some people have said that sort of territoriality comes from and that kind of defence of our own. Um, but we've taken it to another extreme, you suggest. Yeah, there's, a, there's another um, ethology concept I talk about in the book of the idea of, of a pseudo-species, which, which human, only humans seem... To, to, all animals have one set of behaviours for any other species, um, you know, rules about when they'll kill other animals, and not that they never kill their own, but there's a very different set of rules that apply to fighting with your own species versus another. And humans sometimes seem to get into modes of thinking of their own as just the people of a certain nationality, or just the people of a certain religion, or just the people of a certain language. And in the lead up to almost any war, you see people starting to come up with slang terms for the other side that kind of implies not quite human, or sometimes it doesn't just imply. I mean, in the, in the genocide of the Tutsis, they were being called cockroaches mm. by, by the other And broadcasting it but over the radio. The, yeah, that was the mm. slang for Tutsis, was, was the word for cockroach. Um, so sometimes it's as explicit as... So you evoke the feeling of disgust against the other. Yeah, or, or the idea of not human, some, something else. And I think that there's, there's a certain, like, inherent divisions in people looking very different or speaking languages that the other one can't understand, that a certain amount of the pseudo-species may come about by some things that are uniquely human, like relying on language as much. But that lots of them are, again, just, just played up and emphasized very intentionally by the, the leaders who wish to bring about the conflict. So, I mean, that said, I, I wonder whether we are getting much better at recognising the humanity of others through things like social networking. You know, I'm seeing you know, people are actually interacting. We're looking at the Arab Spring series of events. People are interacting with people on the ground in those countries now as I don't think we ever have before in real time. So people in America and Australia are busy tweeting people in Cairo. They're just finding each other and finding that connection. So, you know, I wonder whether we might be sort of over-accentuating our... And, we're, and indeed, if you look at homicides, for example, if, we, you know, in a sense, violence has been reduced if you look at the actual stats in communities. So is this really a version of supernormal stimuli? I, 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 think that, I think that the internet is very helpful for this sort of threat, threat war issue because I think the conventional media has always been somewhat specific to a country and tended at least at times of big conflict to follow the dictates of, of its government and, and the internet doesn't do that. It's completely international and it's not following anybody's orders. So I think that we may begin to see surrender signals and begin to get more overt messages about how much people on the other side are just like us than, than this kind of propaganda about differences. I, I think the, the internet may, you know, may definitely make some difference. In so the internet's that. okay, but you think television is a big boo-boo in this conversation about supernormal stimuli. You think telly has just roped us in with terrible consequences. Well, I think it's, it's a supernormal stimulus for social impulses, for, for a few others also, but, but mainly for social impulses that, 
that we're coded to like sitting around, talking and listening with smiling, happy, friendly people, and this establishes social bonds. And, and television can, can just, with its laugh tracks and its actors who can just look happier and friendlier and more vivacious than any real group of people but you're going to really be in the room with. they really are my friends, those people on um, the telly. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't know you're alive and they, they don't might. care don't about they? you oh, and God. you're not <laughs> establishing real social networks that will support you. Um, and in fact, you're taking time away from doing that. I, I, and then sort of back to the sedentary death syndrome, you're not getting any exercise while you do that, not that all socialization involves a lot of exercise, but we get really abnormally still when we sit and stare at a television in a way that we don't when we talk to real people. So yeah, I think, I mean, people emphasize the content in television is bad, but, but I think really just that there's a lot to the medium that, that is, is very bad for us. Whereas the internet is a mixed bag. There are many ways Except in which... Except now most of us are sitting on the internet while we're watching television. Uh, well, the, the <laughs> so internet a has a lot of content that is kind of like television mm. where you're passively watching something. And I, I think aspects of it are very much like television. But then it has a lot that's much more interactive and and so for you know for social network sites and email there really is another individual that you are doing something for your relationships with so i think the internet is much more of a mixed bag it's almost as bad for us in how sedentary it is in terms of lack of exercise but socially i think it it both promotes certain mm. real um, things and also has some TV like a super normal. You know, I'm not, I must say I'm not terribly convinced by all the arguments in this book. And one of them that you make is that we uh, is looking at say nuclear versus renewables. So you suggest that we are more drawn towards nuclear because it's a form of super normal stimuli, and renewables, well, that's just everyday, um, you know the energy of the sun and wind, we've, it's been with us forever. It's not as novel, so therefore we're not as drawn to it. I mean, what's the case that you're making here? Oh, no, no, not, not um, I think you misunderstand, not we in the sense of the people in this room or even most of the people on the earth are much more drawn toward natural power and atomic energy seems like something really strange to them. But the scientists who actually developed the technology um, are a very unusual group. And I think the science of certain chemical reactions, but especially atomic physics, are very intellectually intriguing to the people who actually have to carry this stuff out. Mm. And the, the science to really producing the windmill structures right. and the water mill structures and all is kind of simple engineering and it's so simple it's that the not. people <laughs> that do it the best don't, go, I mean the people who would be best at it are not in the field. The people who could really develop the best engineered stuff at the lowest costs don't find it the most intellectually intriguing task. I mean, when I, when I talk to scientists about why aren't you working on this kind of energy instead of that, it's not like, oh, I think this is better for the earth or not. It, it's like, oh, the, the nuclear physics and the elaborate chemistry is just so much more interesting. Hmm. The, the other kind of engineering. It, it's and someone yet, else yet some of our other. smartest people find renewable, the I, challenge I, I, I of renewable that technology is very that is interesting. Just, that is just shifting, though. Hmm. I, I don't think that was true even 10 years ago. So this is where you think that we have developed a, a sort of super normal intellect, isn't it? I think that, um, yeah, that, that for humans, rather distinctively from the other animals, that, that certain kinds of mental challenges are, are very interesting. Um, and, and, and I don't think anyone decided, oh, nuclear explosions would be good for the planet, so let's figure out how to do them. It's, 
it's that that kind of physics is so much more intriguing to the way our minds work, that kind of the minds that can do the most elaborate things in that direction went there, not, not wind energy then. But, but a, lot of, um, a lot of the things we spend a lot of our time on are not as sort of inherently vapid as television. But, you know, you know every, every educated person works crossword puzzles or plays chess or something that is really pulling those I like an intellectual challenge thing. And, and for lots of these things, it, it's not, you know, it's not going to kill us like some of our food and sedentary death syndrome is, or, or she like says the, with a grimace. or like responding to the to the sort of hyped up defensive mm. stimuli. It's only potentially going to waste time. I mean, the, what you're doing while you play chess or do the crossword puzzle, you can maybe be working out how that Except windmill Except we now know that it protects better. our brains against Alzheimer's to an extent. So bring ah, it on, but, I say. But, compare, but compared to other exercise. spare time, no, crosswords don't compare to exercise. Exercise actually does better. No, in the studies where people who do more crosswords in their spare time are less likely to get Alzheimer's, the other people are watching television. They're, they're not in the lab working on the wind energy. I mean, definitely any intellectual activity seems to, um, to some extent, protect against Alzheimer's. I think they're finding that Alzheimer's has its beginnings earlier and earlier, and I'm not sure how much that is a causative rather than correlational that people who are going to develop Alzheimer's in 30 years are likelier to be doing crosswords and not watching as much television may sort of be the very, very early. Clearly, not all um, supernormal stimuli are bad for us. I mean, you know, we are stimulated by, you know, extreme beauty and art and music and things that might not feel like they're terribly pragmatic ways to use our time, but they inspire us so. So we, we kind of need our supernormal stimuli as well, don't we? We want to soar the great heights. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if need them is the, the term, but certainly they're, they're ones that are not particularly harmful. I mean, I think they're never where we should be spending our time if we have a critical shortage of time and, and you know, there are emergencies. But human beings have excess time for meeting survival needs. And, Certainly things like visual arts and literature are somewhat supernormal stimuli, but I think the greatest literature may actually condense some of the benefits of real social interaction, that you might actually, in reading a great novel, learn more per hour about human relationships than you would relating to a real human being, mm. which is not the case for the television that pulls the social instincts equally strongly. But many of them, I think, they do no more than potentially waste time, but then others are potentially quite deadly. Gosh, there's so much to talk about here, and we'd love your input as well. So. Let's get some questions and comments going for Deirdre. We've, we've covered a lot of terrain here. Mm -hmm. Sex, war, porn, death, life, the intellect. What more is there to life? Um, we have a microphone here. We'd love, I know it's sort of a bit of an issue having it there, but be brave. Come on up and ask a question um, if you've got one or make a comment. And um, any thoughts? Come on. Yes, be the first person. Thank okay. you, sir. <laughs> And feel free to go and grab another glass. Is the bar still open? It is, yes. Feel free to go and have another glass of wine at this interval or a cup of tea or a glass of water or something. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. It's fascinating. Um, I guess it's a pronoun question. Who is this we? Because it's come up several times, we do this, we do that. But mm. I'm not the guy hiring psychologists for my toy company to make toys that are really compellingly sticky for, for kids to mm. buy. And I'm mm. not the you know food company figuring out how to package the potato chips. And I'm not the guy telling us all that we're going to be burned to death by the uh, 
Iraqis or the Iranians or whoever tomorrow's enemy is. And so for me, you've said something really interesting about the abuse of supernormal stimuli, and I want to read your book. Um, and I think you'd say that we can use our prefrontal cortex and our ability to communicate with each other to undermine the effect, I hope that you're saying that we can undermine the effectiveness of, of some of these supernormal stimuli. But I'm interested in, do you believe that states or other agencies should be trying to regulate the abuse of mm. supernormal stimuli, especially with, for me, the, the key thing is children. Because having read um, Fast Food Nation, mm. there's lots in there about how these companies are really getting inside the skulls of three-year-old kids. So regulate something else? That's a great question because we need to look, you need to save us from ourselves, Deirdre. Um, yes, I mean, Personally, I, I do advocate regulating some of it, although I certainly think there's always going to be a debatable trade-off between individual liberties and kind of what's best and kind of, you know, socialistic government deciding what's best. But I, I think there, there should be some sort of balance there, as, as a lot of countries have already achieved with mm. the tobacco. Um, and I, th I think that starting, well, like with the food, doing some things pretty analogous to kind of what, what happened with tobacco, that it's easiest to start on the just absolutely, you know, do not advertise for children, do not look like you're trying to create new consumers, is one that, that more people will, will get behind in terms of the, the junk bad food, except unlike cigarettes, very few parents were really trying to get their kids to smoke, whereas plenty of parents really feed their kids just even worse, less healthy food than, than they eat themselves. So, so it's not just regulating the companies as much as I, I think you want a lot of sort of parental education about just, you know, because you just constantly hear, Oh, but you know, I should wa watch it because I'm overweight, but my child is not overweight. And it's kind of like, yeah, but you're setting them up to be by age 12 and type 2 diabetes by 35. Just more of that kind of long-term impact education. But I think that um, there, there are a lot of things that we can do besides prohibit. And I'm, I'm much more on top of what some of the current existing laws in the United States are, but in the United States, the government subsidizes farmers to grow certain crops. And it's like corn, most of which is turned into corn syrup. And, and the, the farmers fight like crazy if, if you talk about taking away farm subsidies. But we don't want to take them away, we want to shift them. There are no farm subsidies for growing broccoli or spinach <laughs> or anything that's good for you, essentially. They're all for a few crops that are basically the stuff that goes into to junk food. So I think, first of all, we in the United States, we need to shift those subsidies. And in other countries, if there aren't already subsidies, you can set up subsidies for, the, for growing the, the healthy foods. Mm. And, and likewise, I think in, in the United States, there's certain grants to people starting new small businesses, and most of them now go to people opening franchises of, of McDonald's and Burger King, and that, that is not what they were originally intended to, but technically, when you open a McDonald's, you just have a certain business relationship with McDonald's, and, and you're the, uh, the mm. proprietor. So you can get these grants to start a McDonald's. And again, we could re-engineer those where health food stores get startup grants and you know new chains of junk food stores don't so i think there's actually a lot of other legislating that's not literally prohibiting mm, mm. tax taxing things i mean that that's tobacco taxes have just been raised and raised and i think you can do that with certain defined you know this percentage of sugar, this percentage of white flour, certainly. But it's been a real battle even getting trans fats out of things, mm -hmm. hasn't but, it? But that's, it is starting. I really think we're, in the United States at least, we're about 
where we were with tobacco 35 years ago or something, of just mm. starting. And I really think that lung cancer deaths just had to rise and rise before people really took tobacco seriously. And I think we're really starting to see the effects of, and sometimes it's just bear the cost of in mm. socialized medicine, you know, like, like more and more and more of the cost of medicine is obesity-related things, and I think we're going to get that shift that we did with tobacco. Now, I know you've all been shy, because it, so if you could come up to the mic, if that, that'd be great, and, and line up if you can. I mean, the reason why they're doing that is they're really keen to get the event on camera so that they can pop it on the great RI Oz website, so if you could help us out here, um, that'd be great. Thank you. Hi, I'm um, one of those evil nuclear physicists who's... Uh, <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Responsible for all the evil in this world. Um, but anyways, uh, so my, my question is, you have described what super normal stimuli are mm -hmm. um, and how they affect us. Uh, but would it be also fair to say that if it weren't for super, super normal stimuli, we would not have... Uh, Great discoveries, inventions, works of art. Take that a little bit further. What's your what's your thought there? Well, you know, I mean, when I think of my own work, um, creativity is is sparked by some sort of stimulus. Mm. You know, maybe I watch watch a fantastic movie with the, one of these uh, you know perfect women. <laughs> they have their purpose. <laughs> you never know. Um, see, it's not like eating a boiled potato that sparks the creativity in me. Yeah. I, guess, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So. I can't think why not. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess I have two sort sort of associations to that question. One. One is, I, I do think that perhaps our instincts about sort of more and more and more for the intellectual stimulation, um, that, that, yeah, that, that's certainly one of the instincts where I think the, the supernormal stimuli that it leads to are, are probably more positive, less negative than our ones, uh, our sort of social instincts gone astray, our, you know, nurturing, you know, feeding a pocket pet instead of, you know, real, real duties kinds of, of things. So, so yeah, I, I think that the, the kind of intellectual curiosity instincts are, are somewhat different, and I talk about them in a last chapter as sort of a, I think it has some applications here, but I'm much more uh, tenuous. But the other issue of just whether supernormal stimuli are inspirational or muses or, or mm. we need them or, or something that, that kept coming up is, is the idea that there's something sort of anti-hedonistic about not having the supernormal things around and having the natural things around. And I, I really don't think if we, as a society, kind of re-engineered our environment somewhat, you know, more to what is good for us and what our instincts are coded for, or as an individual when we try to do that kind of separately from society. I don't think it makes for less pleasure. I mean, I honestly think that hunter-gatherers on the savanna enjoyed their leaves and occasional nut and Berries only went in season Lucky as much yeah. as people eating fancy French cuisine in a fine restaurant do these days. That you mm. for, you kind of get used to whatever you know your your daily and your your sort of pleasure thresholds reassert. And even people who just go, oh, I hate vegetables. I would be miserable if I never ate another cake. That that's really actually not true. A, a few weeks into doing it, it's much better, and a year into doing it, your whole... So you're thinking we can experience the same extremes of culinary pleasure if we have yes, a, a plate I, of broccoli? Yes, and I think, you know, I think that 
that you, yeah yes if you're she if says. you're not <laughs> if you're not eating cakes in between I think that that yes that people that eat all natural vegetables and just never t touch the other stuff really enjoy their food at least as much in fact if you're staying a little hungrier and not overeating I think you enjoy your food even more Okay, um, I want you to tell that to your children and, next and time you I give them a plate of broccoli. I think that people appreciated, <laughs> you know, female beauty and male handsomeness when it was in its more natural form and we were not seeing all these supernatural mm -hmm. images. I think that really the pleasure response is kind of built into us to respond to what's out there and it's only the supernormals. It's sort of the way heroin makes you such that you can't enjoy any simpler pleasure as, as it kind of raises the threshold of pleasure doesn't yeah, it yeah yeah and it definitely takes a while as you're coming off it for your body to adjust but it does mm. i think the same is true of everything tasting so sweet and fatty or you know every face looking so supernaturally beautiful or I any of these changes that you notice that, that I make. nearly used this to turn the quest next question <laughs> on <laughs> put, that's too, too <laughs> normal stimuli I'm afraid it operate that way yeah. um, I'm interested in the cultural context of this because obviously you know none of this is happening in a cultural vacuum um, particularly with attractiveness um, now what you're talking about was probably mostly Western ideals of attractiveness but that there are cultural moderators of that um, as far as you know, what we in the West deem as attractive is not historically or even currently a universal ideals of beauty. Um, how does that, those cultural constructs tie in with the supernormal stimuli? Mm. Well, I actually don't think that, that cultural norms of beauty has, have varied as much as, as is often claimed. Um, but I also think that one thing they track is the main ways in which people differed from each other. And I don't think that even though I know some other books claim that, that very high body mass indexes were viewed as attractive in this and that culture, I think when you really realistically look at most of the people that were considered the great beauties of their time, that they're really pretty similar to the modern ideal. But what's really different is that, that thinness wasn't talked about as an attractive trait. Most of the attractive people were fairly thin, but it wasn't being talked about. But that was because body weights didn't used to vary. It, it just wasn't a way mm. in which two people, uh, you know, if, if one was more attractive than the other, weight wasn't likely to be the factor. Whereas now, if you take two people and one's much more attractive than the other, it's very likely that weight is the difference. And you see things that have almost dropped out now, like um, a couple centuries back when smallpox was rampant, smooth skin was just talked about as this female beauty thing all the time. An unmarked skin, and um, and people would like. I mean, now if like a personal's ad said I had all, have all my own teeth, that would be like a joke. <laughs> but um, you know, but but sort of you know in. In intact teeth was was actually a way of writing. Uh, you know, when when sort of how much scarring there was on your skin was a common variation, then smoothness of skin was was a big deal. So I think that mm -hmm. you you see changes over time in mm -hmm. what's emphasized as attractiveness, mainly based on how it can vary. And and actually, I personally think that anorexia nervosa is not so much produced by the valuing of thinness and the emphasis on thinness, but I think you only see it in cultures where there are actually a lot of overweight people, that becoming afraid of being very overweight isn't very possible in a culture where you're not seeing very many overweight people and where you're not eating the kind of supernormal food that you can feel sort of pulling you to eat. And if you if you watch where it tracks around the world, um, mm. it looks like fast food comes in or, or sort of other processed food comes in, weights go up, and then anorexia appears. Not, you know, not... Interesting. That's interesting. Thank you for that question, please. Thank you. Yes, uh, given the 
array of threats we have facing humanity. Um, do you think that we'll, one way or another, be able to get through it all, relatively intact, say by the year 2100? What hope for humanity? Um, I mean, on, on the big guesses where, as to whether, you know, I mean, it kind of only takes one or two madmen to blow the whole planet up, so I think that one is just kind of a statistical crapshoot as to whether, you know, possibly we could end up destroyed. The technology to destroy us is certainly there right now, and, and there's just such quirky individual variation that could do that. But in terms of the other things, like the pollution of our environment and how bad our food and eating habits have gotten, if you take away the sort of high-tech war stuff, I think that it's going to get worse before it gets better, but I don't think those things are going to annihilate us. I think mm. that we're already becoming aware of some of those problems. And I do think that technology, you know, sometimes has some fixes for that. I mean, the human lifespan has not been dropping from our horrific eating so far because, you know, we're inventing all these interventions. Um, mm. You know, so there's some, so I, I think that we're, I think that we're going to do a lot of these things way later than ideal and kind of suffer more than we have to, like with the tobacco issue. Yeah. But I think we're going to start cleaning up our environment. Um, I think we're going to start eating differently and exercising more. Um, but, but I think it's just going to come way later at more of a cost mm. than it seems like it. What do you should think? Have. Oh, yeah, what do you think? Oh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm more pessimistic. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, well, along the lines you're saying, we will do things late, but probably too late. And we only need one, one of those array of things to just be too bad, and mm -hmm. we'll seriously suffer for it. But, uh, I think the signs are there already. Mm -hmm. mm. Any more questions or comments? Do we have any more? Well, on that, vi oh, yes, you do. Excellent. And we've got two. Excellent. Thank you. We have a few more minutes left, just a few more minutes. So, um, given that you can make an awful lot of money by selling people foods that are bad for them, and given that you can also view uh, things like um, pseudoscientific doomsday cults as, uh, as a form of supernormal stimuli, <laughs> there's obviously a lot of power and money to be made from encouraging people to respond to these things. Who is doing research into what discourages you from doing it and why would anyone do so? Um, well, I, I mean, a lot of the same marketing things apply to selling anything. And I, I mean, business people would be just as happy to be making money selling us broccoli as cheeseburgers. It, 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 it's sort of an amoral, not evilly intended sort of Thing. Really, what, what is driving how bad our food is, I, I really believe at core is our own instincts which are geared to the savannah and not, not geared to modern environment. But the marketeers are exploiting that, that in and us. And that they're exploiting it. They're, they're, they're aggravating the problem, but they're not really the core of the problem. Well, well part of my point is that they can, they can sell more, yes, people would sell you more broccoli, but they can sell even more broccoli if they can breed a new strain of broccoli that has more carbs and fewer nutrients in it and therefore triggers our supernormal response yeah, to well, well that's why that I say than this broccoli. I, that's why I say I, I do favor government laws and regulation of that and one thing you can do is set incentives such that business will make more money doing the healthier thing that, that there would be incentives for developing mm. broccoli that's got even more of the old nutrients that have already slightly been bred out of it rather than has more carbs or tastes sweeter or but something. But aren't we in the 21st century? Aren't we going to just genetically modify our cells so that we don't get, you know, have strokes, heart disease or cancer? Isn't that the ultimate quest? So we'll eat whatever the hell we want. Well, it's so interesting that people always pose it if we were going to genetically engineer ourselves it would be to 
fix it so we can eat all the sugar. They're talking and about vaccinations against lung cancer. It, it probably makes more funded sense. Funded by tobacco companies. Probably makes more sense if we were going to genetically engineer ourselves to genetically engineer ourselves not to like the taste of sugar. That, that's like one we almost can't oh no, imagine. Please don't do that. But, but it probably would take many fewer to really like some of the phytochemicals in green vegetables. It's probably actually would take fewer tweaks to to do what that's what evolution would do in the long run. It wouldn't just make us keep eating more and more sugar and not have the bad effects. It would make us like the healthier food and the, the but it would take another like. 100,000 years of evolution to, to change that. We're going to allow uh, one little comment and I'd we'll pull up the next well, one. I'd sneak in one mini comment, yeah. David, yeah. which is that um, rather than genetically engineering ourselves to be immune to these things, as anyone found, for example, that just as there are people who are immune to HIV, that there are some people who are less prone to being responsive to supernormal stimuli. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Let's have another final question while we're here, while Deidre's thinking about that one. Hi. Uh, just two questions. Uh, the first one would be the um, the two ladies that you showed. I would maybe ask which one would you rather have sex with, and which one would you spend the rest of your life with? Because there's both. You a bit can of get look both, in both you know, in the same package. It's very difficult <laughs> in some times. And the second one is maybe a, a Brave New World type question, and that would be um, with the ability of changing people's uh, thoughts with hypnotherapy. Why wouldn't we use that to? change a three-year-old's thought patterns to stop them from being a murderer when they become older? Gee, that's, that's complex. Um, yeah, because, because, because behaviours like that are a lot more complex than not feeling pain oh, in short term yeah. during mm. surgery. It, it's not necessarily doable. For one thing, we don't necessarily identify the people but why not just take them all who might and just brainwash if. them all oh <laughs> but i mean kids are, kids are on a trajectory aren't they you, you right. can't yeah. pick it's, and it's it. not like hypnosis can do everything and in fact it um i mean the things i'm describing about helping people with weight loss it really vary with different individuals hypnotizability of course, um, yeah. so some of your murders not not be very hypnotizable <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much um can we please thank deirdre barrett Thank you.